Good morning to everyone all over, mainly down at UT, I think. Um, Evenston, I am based right now sitting on the banks of the Zambezi on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia. I'm on the Zambian side across from Mana Pools. Um, I'll go into the, the system shortly. Um, but my background is, is a mixture. It's um, for the last 25 years, I've been working in protected area management, um, mainly here with Conservation Lower Zambezi and the Lower Zambezi, but also with African parks up in Ethiopia, who has incredibly knowledgeable um, conservationists across Africa. Um, hopefully I can share a little bit of what I've learned and what we're implementing. And um, one thing I would like to stress, please, please feel free to ask questions. This is all about, I think where people learn is by asking. Okay, so please feel free to interrupt partway through the talk or, or, or to, to put your questions down towards the end, et cetera. But just so that you do have those questions, because I'm more than happy. And I think that's where I've learned a lot of what I've learned is just by simply asking questions. There's a, across the river is also a series of hunting and multiple use zones. Um, some are put aside for um, the map in front of you shows the Zambian side, um, the national park being the middle of it. Um, whereas there are multiple use areas, communities can live in them, but there are also wildlife areas generally put aside for hunting, but not always. Um, they're also put aside for photographic tourism. And you'll see Luano going right up to the north. That connects to what we call the Luangwa um, system, which is North Luangwa, South Luangwa, et cetera. So there's these great big different systems that um, exist in Zambia. Zambia is very privileged to have them, and I'm privileged to, to work in one of them. Um, my, my role here is as um, um, with an advisory and support role to the Department of National Parks and Wildlife. Um, they are the authority in the area. C where I'm going to call it CLZ rather than saying conservation law is um, busy. Um, CLZ has been working with, um, it was in response because of the, the heavy poaching in the area in the 80s and 90s, uh, this whole area, both Zimbabwe, Zambia and Mozambique was full of rhino, um, lots of elephants, etc. Rhinos were completely wiped out and, and elephants were on their way out. So it was a, it was a response to that by stakeholders in the area. Um, and in 94, they formed CLZ as a, as a non-government organization. Um, I'll go, I'm going to focus quite a lot on the security side. Um, but what I would like is that people recognize that traditionally everyone did focus on the search, but more and more people are recognizing that we've got to start thinking outside the box and without benefits going to the communities, without the communities understanding, deriving something from these protected areas, um, we're, we're, just, we're just sort of holding up the, the dike and with a finger in it. We, need, we really need to get them involved, understand and benefit from it. So I will touch on that as well. Um, Lower Zambezi was home to um, the, the big Tuskers when I first came here. This one, Big Boy, which was, um, that's, you can see that's 52, those are kilos and 48, so it's, it's over 100 pounds per side. It's what was one of the big Tuskers in the area, and it was on my, or just after I started down here. So it just sort of sends home what, what can happen in these areas. Around the world, you probably all know that, um, that poaching, now the illegal wildlife trade, is a multi-billion dollar, not million dollar, but billion dollar industry now. Um, the third largest illegal wildlife industry in the world. Um, and it funds terrorism, it funds governments, it funds all sorts of illegal activities, et cetera. Um, big syndicates are involved. So it is, it is a global issue right now that there's a lot more of attention um, being paid to it. Uh, th these are just some of the records since um, I've been working with conservation lawyers and busy to just show these trends of, of um, elephant poaching in our area, even with all of our resources and, and um, expertise and support to the, to the government, 
and the Department of National Parks here, you can see we do have big spikes in poaching in the area. Poaching is not the only threat in protected areas. Um, every area has its own threats. These are some of the ones for um, Lower Zambezi, but I'm sure they are shared by a lot of different um, protected areas around Africa. Um, we're on one of the big river sources in, in um, Africa, so is a, is a um, river, sorry, is a threat to the area. Um, we've, we've put a lot of efforts into that in recent years and, and support communities to fish, to fish sustainably in the area, which I'll touch on shortly. Um, mining, both small scale and large scale, is a threat to, to protected areas. Um, governments need and the world needs um, the resources that come out of the ground, they, the wildlife. Um, which creates problems, and Lower Zambezi is one of them. Um, we've got a big, we've got a um, threat of a large-scale copper mine in the national park um, that we've been trying to combat and deal with the government and um, the mining companies on that. And um, we've also got a threat of a lot of small-scale farming since the prices of gold have gone up. So the small-scale farmer, that photo in the middle, um, where areas of small rivers are dug by hand and then they're panned and it creates a lot of degree heavily on um, the meat while they're in their panning. So the, the wildlife side is another problem. Um, encroachment, this part is very intact. We're very lucky with that, but in the north, um, we border onto a main access road and there is um, encroachment in the very north of the park. Um, governments are often very reluctant to deal with those um, issues because we've been working on for quite a few years with the, with the government and the national parks. Deforestation, the charcoal industry um, is huge, particularly in Zambia. Although it has one of the most intact forestation in Africa also, and it's a real true threat to the area. <coughs> Human wildlife conflict and human elephant conflict, I'll touch on further down. Another big threat, um, you know, the communities perceive wildlife and that does not bring benefit and it just brings problems to them. So it's a threat to their fields, it's a threat to their lives, et cetera. So unless conflicts are addressed, the communities will always resent having wildlife in their area, understandably. Um, lack of community benefits and alternative livelihoods, as I, I touched on that before, unless, um, unless the communities do benefit from this, we're, we're not going to be going anywhere in the long term. Um, floods and fires, we've got a lot, particularly the, the fire accessibility in our park is very poor, and therefore the um, the to be able to manage those fires very difficult. And then we've got the a challenge of a proposed dam that would end up flooding a lot 40 years, I think. This shows the, the top left photo, you, the, um, the boundary in white on the center and right is the national park. Um, you can see the encroachment in the north of it that, that I was referring to before. Um, the poor community awareness so, and benefit sharing um, is another one. Um, you can see that the, the park is basically surrounded um, and in the north that encroachment is there. Annual fires cover the park <clears throat> and then the charcoal and livestock also are another big threat. Saying all that, all those threats, we are incredibly fortunate to be home to one of the Africa. Um, it is one of the strongholds of a huge elephant population between Zimbabwe, Zambia and um, Mozambique. Um, I found, um, was estimated about 23,000 elephants in the area, so it's substantial. We've got um, all except for the, the rhino in the area, so four of the big five are thriving tourism um, population. 
so conservation law is ambiguous. It has three main pillars. As um, they've got wildlife protection, which I'll, which I, I said I will go into. We've got a large environmental education program, and we program. And I'm going to touch on each of those pillars, and then also on um, the research side, which is something we're now moving into. So on the on the security side, there's there's so many different components to it, but I will touch on a, on a few of these. Um, foot patrols are your are your sort of mainstay in the protection within the park. They and they um, the the res are very low or limited. Because they're down in the park, and if you protect them properly, you're not going to you're not going to have those results down inside the park. You'll have them more around the park if you're doing it correctly. But you, nevertheless, you cannot um, do without those teams in the park. Um, area patrols, I'll touch on also. Aerial support on any protected area of any size um, is vitally important. It plays a huge role in spotting and understanding legal activity. Um, we, because of manpower issues in Zambia, we work with the communities and have a community scout unit that are recognized under the government, and they support the Department of National Parks and Wildlife with their, with their efforts. <coughs> We've um, worked on specialized units such as dog units, tracking dog and detection dog units, um, rapid deployment teams, investigations and intelligence units, um, and so these are all sort of specialized areas that we've been working. We've, in recent years, probably the last five years, we've started working a lot more cross-border um, for the cross-border illegal wildlife trade. And so we work with the Zimbabwean authorities on the other side um, quite a lot. It, it helps to combat a lot of that trade and try to stop some of the leakages in, in whichever country you're working in. Um, I heard Johan say you've got to talk at some stage on, on prosecutions and the legal process. So it was something CLZ found. We were having successes in the field. They were going into the courts and then they were either being released or not getting the, the penalties they need. So we now employ um, lawyers. We work with um, another NGO in Zambia called Wildlife Crime Prevention. Um, they've got lawyers across Zambia. We call them legal assistants and they monitor and assist with all of the um, the prosecutions of all of the cases that we have <clears throat> and our our um, success rate in prosecutions now has gone hugely high um, fisheries management as i touched on before is another big one and then you know building the capacity within the in, in the wildlife sector exactly like you guys are doing now at school we're investing a lot more in that so these leaders will be coming through in years to come these are just a few, um, touching on a few of the, the sort of figures from last year. You can see the number of man days and patrol we put out there. Um, ivory that's recovered, that's not necessarily from this national park, but it's from um, transit routes and cross-border routes around the national park. Um, the number of suspects that are arrested, you know, firearms, et cetera. Um, and so, and pangolin remain a big, a big issue. They're, they're, they're still the largest traded um, wildlife product in, in the world now. And Zambia is a stronghold of pangolin. So yeah, we still have a big issue with that. And there's a lot of focus put on that. I'll just touch on a few of the, the specialized units so people have a little bit more of an understanding. As I said, the foot patrols are, um, you can't do without them, but they don't, they don't have that same, they, they don't have that same return in the field. However, you, you do something like you invest in a canine unit, which are incredibly expensive to run, um, but their successes are very high. So we, we have a small unit, it's only three dogs and, and nine officers in it. And they run, their, they work um, 30 days a month on a rotation basis. And you can see the successes that they have for such a small unit are very high. They focus a lot around the national park, um, trying to stop people coming in, or if there has been um, issues within the park, then they'll be following up on it around the national park. 
Their, their operations are mainly intelligence led, um, but they also something you can't put a, a price tag on or estimate is the, is the deterrent factor. And I think that's one of the roles that the canine unit play a heavy role in. We'll, we have a rapid deployment team as well that works around the national park, very well resourced, a little bit like the canine unit. Their results are very similar. So people say, why don't you do just two rapid deployment teams rather than a dog unit? Because the dogs don't have, you know, a lot of these arrests, et cetera, that the dog unit have is not necessarily a, a, um, attributed to the dogs. It's attributed to the team being well resourced and well trained, et cetera. But it's that deterrent factor of having dogs in an area, putting them on roadblocks, putting them in village sweeps, you know, putting them around an area. And it just makes it more and more difficult for people to trade in wildlife. And the, the bigger the deterrent, the less wildlife trade you have in your area, basically. Um, the rapid deployment team, all of these teams, you know, they don't come without problems. Um, we actually had to restructure our deployment team because the controls in place were not strong enough um, but they you can see from the results they do a really good job they're well resourced um, they have their own vehicles and equipment their their um, fitness standards are incredibly high um, and they, they they do a great job out there and they respond to the intelligence that we gather through the intelligence units and the other units that we have um, aerial support is a big role. I, I fly the plane for conservation lowers. I'm busy. Um, we only do fly about 20, 20 hours a month, um, but it covers a big chunk of the park each month. And you can see it resulted in detecting 75% of the poached elephants inside the national park last year. That is not always the case. I think the average would probably be closer to 40 or 50% but it probably does find about 50% of the illegal activity, whether that's carcasses or drying racks or poachers fires or, or whatever. It, it doesn't stop things happening, but it gives you a good indication of what's happening in an area. And it also allows you to better manage your, your assets in those areas. <laughs> we combine that with, um, with choppers. Also, we have chopper operations. Um, that we share with other national parks where we bring choppers in. We have grants um, that we share with other, other NGOs that are doing a similar support role to national parks in Zambia. The chopper is incredibly expensive to run, but incredibly effective when it's in here. And we're, we're finding it is definitely money wisely spent. Yeah. That maybe just while I'm on that, I think, and it's something all parks can learn is the, Zambia is incredibly fortunate to have um, a group of NGOs that work really well together. Um, a lot of our grants we put in with other NGOs, so we get, we get um, co-funding from another NGO or another NGO gets co-funding from us, um, and it makes us much more attractive to, to the donor community that's out there. We share a lot of information um, between each other. We work together. We share trainings, all of that sort of thing. And I think it it just strengthens your your collaboration and, and work within um, the country and within the protected areas. The the small scale mining I touched on before. Um, it is one of our big threats. We've just um, recently got some funding through the Elephant Crisis Fund, which is which is fantastic. Is it um, the access to an area? Why a national park? Why not outside the national park? Um, and just try to better understand that so that we can work with the communities around the area and how best to manage that because it is having a big impact on the area. There's, um, we, have op we had an operation, for example, last month where, we, um, where nine of the rapid response unit and canine guys arrested 75 people and had to foot them all the way out of the park. They arrested 82 and I think 75 ended up getting to the area where we picked them all up. So it's it's quite large scale and it does have a massive negative impact. Um, the fisheries, we have a, a, a um, dedicated fisheries program now working with the communities mainly 
to set up fisheries action groups and management groups so they um, better manage their own resources. We are having great success with that, which is really good. Um, there is still a lot of illegal netting, et cetera, that goes on, but there has been a, um, a great reduction in that and it seems to be working. Yeah. Um, the prosecution side, as I said before, we have a legal team, uh, legal team that go and monitor the court cases. They also, they also, a lot of these countries don't have the, the data um, collection mechanisms to be able to check if someone, for example, uh, um, someone, a suspect has been caught before and this might be his second or third offense. So those databases aren't in place and we're helping the government to put all those databases in place. We spend a lot of time bringing um, the magistrates into the area so they understand what the national parks um, system are trying to do and why they're protecting it and the difficulties, et cetera. Um, and that has helped us to get the magistrates to better understand it and the <coughs> prosecution rate and the, also the, um, the penalties have increased, which is really uh, you know, a great deterrent. Yeah. Uh, I touched on the cross-border illegal wildlife um, trade before we're working with Mozambique, but particularly with Zimbabwe, um, that's where it's stronger, and with the authorities, but also the NGOs on the other side, um, which is having a big positive impact in the area. So those are those were sort of the main security measures that we're doing. There is an array of other little um, uh, ventures that we have going, but please, if there's questions on those, jot them down or ask away and I can try to answer them, but I know there's a question and answer at the end, and I can try to do that there. Um, but I do just want to stress that the, the, the sort of law enforcement side or wildlife protection side is a short-term fix. It's not fixing any of the long-term problems. And I think the education of people looking at poverty, looking at alternatives, um, empowering communities, benefit sharing with communities, those are your longer... Um, longer successes that you're going to have in your long-term approach yeah. so we we have an education program we have a school here at our base in the lower zambezi um, we can accommodate about uh, 24 students and eight teachers i think it is um, we have we work with 65 schools around the national park they um, our education uh, manager sets up clubs in those schools. The, the winners of quizzes and things like that get to come to the education center on school visits. Um, the, our curriculum is all through the Ministry of Education. It's all uh, modernized and put onto tablets now. So the kids are wanting to learn more. They turn, tend to come to school more because they can play with tablets, um, et cetera. So it's been a real, a real success. The other thing that I think is quite interesting is that a lot of our a lot of our community scouts and also the national parks um, wildlife police officers they are there are students who came through this school that are now um, gone into the system as rangers etc our operations manager who does who oversees all of the law enforcement at conservation mozambizi he is actually um, one of the students who went through the program as well now and he's now second in charge of clz so it's a it has some great positive impacts. We have an outreach program that goes out to the 65 schools at all uh, as well. So they hit a lot, a lot larger numbers, um, thousands of, of students every year. And they go around to the schools. They, they teach the teachers how to, how to put forward the syllabuses, et cetera. They teach them how to use the um, tablets, um, and, and interact with the students and set up the clubs. So that, that's worked quite well. The, um, the education program last year or the last two years actually was almost put on hold because of COVID. Um, our numbers were way, way down um, because of the issues with COVID in the area. So we couldn't, we, you know, the schools were closed in Zambia for a big part of those two years. So we couldn't get out to the students and it greatly affected our numbers, but we did manage to get um, a few school groups in and a few of our and our education program going out on the outreach programs, the teachers training. And we also have scholarships, um, they're conservation based scholarships. And two years ago, we have extended those scholarships to include the universities in Zambia for conservation um, courses. 
community engagement um, is some, it's probably our biggest growing um, component of what we do. We're incredibly fortunate to just get a, a, a very large grant through the um, with French money from the French government through Conservation International um, that we will be implementing in our area. It's all about building conservation agreements with the community so that the community, they will identify what their priorities are and what they need. We may invest in that, and in return, <coughs> we have an agreement in place where they will will put aside certain areas for 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 example for conservation cor or elephant corridors or or um, human wildlife conflict mitigation methods, um, etc. And these agreements are formal agreements that the money doesn't flow unless the agreement um, is fulfilled by both sides. Um, we have put a lot of effort into. Um, human wildlife conflict over the years during the height and time of um, when they're cutting crops, et cetera. We have constantly have um, patrols in the area. We help the um, communities to trial fences. You can see in that top left corner, um, we call that a hippo and elephant fence. It's a wire tape that people cannot use as snares, but it does um, have the same effect as a as an electric wire fence so it keeps the elephants out and we found it very successful um, but doesn't have that that issue of snare wire um, empowering women women <clears throat> are always easier to deal with and better to deal with more successful to deal with than the men generally in communities um, empowering them empowering them to have groups empowering them to have income um, etc has been a real success in the area also we have a sports day an annual sports day every year um, that thousands of people come to actually and that um, they compete against each other but it's supported by the tourism um, lodges in the area and other uh, landowners in the area and it's trying to bring that that sort of community component together with the conservation with the national parks and with the tourism operators um, access to water is a big one. And then we have a series of anti-snaring campaigns, but also of living with elephant campaigns and workshops that we do annually in, in within our areas. And these are you know, just a few of the figures. We've concentrated a lot on COVID in the last couple of years. That seems to be coming back to more of a norm here now, but it is, is a big issue. Um, so a couple of things that we're proud of. I know I heard that the Black Mambas are going to be speaking um, next week, I think um, Johan said, which is really cool. So um, we have also developed Zambia's first all-female um, community scout unit. They're um, some very impressive elite women who are in the unit. It's a, it's a group of 10 women and it's, and it's doing really well. They play a multiple role of being mentors in the community, being figureheads in the community, empowering women, um, going to schools and talking, et cetera, but also out in the field. And, and they are trained as any other officer would be, and they're out in the field patrolling as well. Um, I, I put this in the sustainable fishing, or sorry, sustainable hunting, because I think there's a lot of debate on, is it right or wrong to hunt areas? CLZ don't have, um, we are not anti-hunting. There is a place for it still today in protected area management. There simply is too many areas for photographic or non-consumptive um, use to take over. And if you stopped hunting across Africa right now, the, command, uh, the benefit that the communities would, um, would see would dry up in many places. And you would see that the... Um, the law or the poaching would increase and the relationship between the community and the wildlife would deteriorate even more. So although maybe in long term, you're, you're starting to work away from, um, from hunting and looking at no other non-consumptive initiatives, for right now, there is a place in, uh, we believe there is still a place in Africa for it. Um, we have started on this now it is not up and running fully but along with the um, uh, specialized units we've now developed a marine unit they've got their own boat they're full-time on the river um, they have been selected they're, they're going through their finalized training right now um, and so we're, we're looking forward to them 
to be up and running. And then last year, we also um, worked with the Department of National Parks to set up a long-term training program. One of the faults that I think many of the countries in Africa have is once someone has been trained, often the countries don't have the resources to continually keep retraining those people and their motivation, their skills, their you know, um, ability to use new technologies, et cetera, <clears throat> um, just slowly um, deteriorates. And so we've implemented this long-term training program to start with. It's a five-year program and all of the officers need to go through it. It's, it's refresher courses, but it's also things like control room training, um, specialized unit training, intelligence training, you know, all these different um, skill sets that we can try to upskill uh, uh, all the ranges in the field on. Um, and I, t I said before, addressing the mining um, threat. So this small scale mining is a huge threat to us. It's right in the middle of the national park. We have just um, got the, the agreement signed with the NGO to support it with um, Elephant Crisis Fund. So hopefully over the coming months, we will end up um, starting to un better understand what the drivers of the small scale mining are and how we can address those. Accessibility in the area I've just put in because it does make a huge difference. If you can't access areas, you either need choppers or, or you need incredibly fit people. So we're now investing in road systems, et cetera, and trying to better, or, you know, have better access basically throughout the park, yet not allow other access points for everyone to move around. And then I think the most exciting thing um, to finish off with is we have the endorsement from the Zambian government for a long-term um, restoration program for the Lower Zambezi. Um, it will ultimately hopefully bring back in black rhino to the area, um, and it will bring a lot higher level of community engagement, um, the education side, and also enhanced um, security. So that's a little bit about Lower Zambezi, a little bit about what we do. Um, I think one thing that maybe just to finish off on is, and I touched on it before, there's many different models um, of how to protect areas and the relationships, particularly between managers and government. Some models, are the government are completely looking after the area themselves. Some, they don't have the resources. Some like African parks, they get the, they get the, um, management mandate for an area on behalf of the government, but use government um, staff. So Conservation Lower Zambezi, we have sort of like a co-management um, role down here. We don't have the authority, but we do help with the resources. We do help with human resources and all of the um, infrastructure, et cetera, that we can support them. And it works really well. We've got a great relationship with the department. Um, they, we couldn't do it without them. They couldn't do it without us. And I think both sides recognize that. And we have been lucky to be quite successful in what we do down here. So I'd like to um, finish there and then let people open the, open the um, doors for letting people ask questions. And please feel free. There's no, there's no wrong questions. Um, so yeah, I'll put, hand back over to you, Johan. Um... So everybody, you are now welcome to ask questions. You can uh, write your questions in the chat or you are welcome to use the reaction tools at the bottom or just wave at us, attract, uh, just attract our attention by any means possible. Um, Ian, just to kick off the questions and answers and um, if, if you can perhaps just give us a little bit of context in terms of size, the area that, um, that's being protected there, if we compare it, because a lot of the students are from the South African context, if you would have to compare it with Kruger Park, are we talking larger, smaller? Where, where are we in terms of size? I think, I can't remember what, do you know what Kruger is off your head? Um, square kilometers? Cheryl, where, where... I'm going to ask you if, if you can answer that. We'll have to look it up. We'll have to Google it and get yeah. back to you. I have a feeling it's, it's around 10,000. Sorry? Isn't it a million hectares? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's what, which is right, exactly about 10,000 square kilometers. Oh. Yeah. Yes. So the, the area we're working in is about 22,000 square kilometers. So it's about twice the size of Kruger. Yeah. 
Okay, that just you know gives a, gives a very good geographical context because you can see the size of the staff that you have, and now we know what area you cover with that staff. So that actually you know it it speaks to the efficiency of of the management of that staff, um, because that's that's a large area to protect. Yeah, they are they are massive areas that you know that we obviously put most of our resources into the park. Um, but we, we're doing more and more in the game management around it now. And I'd say probably 60% park and 40% around it now, but that's slowly shifting the other way around, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just a little bit more in terms of the context, um, how many years have has CLZ been involved with the parks authority there? So it, it um, 28, I think it is. So it started in 94. So that uh, brings us up to about 28 years now. Yeah. And the parks authority has changed over the years to, you know, parastatals. And now it's back to a department under a ministry. Um, and oh, there you go. Someone gave Kruger down there. So it's, it's similar to the size of Kruger. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to check if we've got any uh, questions. There's a question. I saw a question about the percentage of um, funding received from the government and then from donors. So, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. It's hard to get a, an accurate figure out of the government. Um, but I, I'm estimating that they put in about a million dollars a year into Lower Zambezi National Park. And we put in about 1.7 million a year. So we actually put in more than the government, but the, if, but the park probably only generates about, I would, and this is a, a guess, but about 1.2 million a year. So we still need to either increase fees or be willing to subsidize um, the national park or allow more tourism in the area. Ian, if, if I may ask, while we don't have another question coming up right now, um, in terms of uh, finding funding for your projects, because you are running really large projects there, um, and I can imagine that um, you would need quite a large budget for it. How do you go about um, finding funding? Where are you applying and how are you applying? Um, yeah, it's, it's probably one of the most difficult parts of it all. Um, we, we are very fortunate the tourism operators in the area, um, they, our CLZ is set up as a membership based NGO. Okay. So the tourism operators play quite a large membership fee to conservation lawyers and MBZ. And just about all of them do it down here. So a big, uh, probably about 10% of our funding comes from the tourism operators and that allows us to cover those less attractive costs, you know, maintenance and salaries and administration costs, et cetera. Um, we can cover a lot of that from the tourism operators money, which makes us more attractive and we can then leverage other um, funding. So the funding comes from all over. Some of it is for a th uh, philanthropic um, funding. Some of it is through government grants like US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, there's organizations like Tusk and, and um, Lion Recovery Fund and Elephant Crisis Fund. There's also um, bilateral funding through the um, EU um, that uh, we tap into from time to time. Um, DEFRA in, the, in England um, supports us. So it's a mixture. Our, our funding pools are quite diverse, but it does take a lot of work. We've got two people um, that work full time on writing grants and reporting on grants. Yeah. And then other people doing the finances for the same thing. So it is a big part of it. And it's very difficult to get that funding. It's very competitive. And as I said before, I think we're lucky in Zambia, how we can work with the other organizations as closely as we do and, and leverage some of that money that maybe otherwise would not come into the country. Thanks, Ian. I, I had some follow-up questions and you answered all of them in your question. So, <laughs> in your answer. Thank you. Uh, we've got Blaine who would like to ask a question. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Blaine. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask you. You guys said that you were... you. You weren't anti-hunting. Um, 
And would would that be could that be used as a benefit in terms of using it as a additional income? Uh, it, for for example, bringing in a yeah, it, uh, an American hunter, uh, for example. So in the national park, um, there is no hunting, but in the game management areas around the national park, there is hunting concessions that we wouldn't get involved in uh, uh, to be a concessionaire for the hunting for the protection of those areas around the national park east of us there's a, a game management area called Rafunsa. there's a, a hunting concession in that that's tendered out near that has it they have to protect that area the same as we have to protect it as a buffer for the national park. So we with them, that area and they're the and in Zambia, 50% of that income. So if a if a client pays five thousand dollars, that goes to the community and 50% of it goes to the government. If, if legal hunting is there, does it um, contribute to a reduction of um, illegal hunting? But yeah, my, my view is I do believe it does because there is no alternative currently to legal hunting in an area. So for example, in Zambia, a community will generate funds from a hunting company coming in and hunting um, their quota. If you take that away, there is no alternative to that right now. There's just not enough photographic or other resource use of that area. And therefore that community wouldn't get that income from the hunting in the area. And they would start utilizing the wildlife illegally. And we have seen that multiple times in multiple countries when hunting has been stopped for short periods. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, Cheryl, please ask your question. Hi, thanks once again, Ian. Um, just a quick question from my side. The environmental education programs that you are presenting, have you got any data to show that your success rates are going up? Is it making a change? Is it, are the learners uh, more proactive in doing something for the environment? Um, yeah, if you can just maybe just add to that. Yeah, Cheryl, great question. And I think what it does do is highlight the need that a lot more people are going into now with this um, M&E, this monitoring and evaluation processes and areas. We were lucky to quite a few years ago to set up a system, a questionnaire system that we monitor the effectiveness of each group compared to other groups that come in. And our awareness um, factor, if you want to call it that, has been increasing over the years. And we can also Id Id identify where um, we have weak awareness and where we have stronger awareness. Yeah. So, and it does, I, I think it's a really good question on everything everyone does is the, the need to put in that M&E before, uh, you know, at the beginning is really vital. Yeah. No, like a before and after questionnaire. So, yeah, and was it qualitative and quantitative data that you captured? Yeah, yeah, we do, yeah. The, the high, it's, it's quite a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, so we, we work with the universities um, here and we bring in interns and they're the ones to help thing for them to understand us the information or some of the information we need we I, I definitely think it's a a weakness of most organizations is to not have a robust enough m e system in place and we are trying to improve ours and i know it's a lot of work because i did 2500 school learners and i did a before <laughs> and after and my questionnaires were answered in zulu yeah. So, wow. And it's ongoing and you can't slack on it. You've got to keep going because sometimes your program is not as strong as what you think. Mm -hmm. So you must keep adapting yeah. programs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay. Ian, a 
question in the chat from uh, Nicolette. Um, is your, in your opinion, how sustainable is the dependency on donor funding? And what would, what would you see as the most beneficial skill to obtain to have an impact on wildlife security? Yeah, um, good question. And I think donors are becoming more and more conscious on the sustainability of, of um, that model, you know, where you're getting donor funding coming in. Um, I, I do think we all need to move more towards where the government, either through the NGOs or through themselves, it doesn't really matter, I don't think, that, that revenue retention for certain areas um, is improved so um, that it helps with that sustainability. I also think you need to look at other um, resource or you know resource generation that you can get from an area like carbon. Um, I saw you have a carbon um, talk coming up, and that's something where we're looking at now. And we do have carbon partners around the national park um, that I think that can help with the sustainability of an ultimately you know around the world there is some um, but there's not a lot of national parks that aren't in some ways subsidized by the government um, either national um, just because we we're all so dedicated to keeping these sort of some wildlife areas wild are all going to be fully sustainable but i do think we all need to work towards that yeah and then what was the second question? Sorry, the second part of it. So uh, which skill would be the most beneficial to have in, in terms of uh, wildlife security or to develop? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think exactly what you guys are doing now, where, you, where you're, you're just behind it. Um, I think everything from building to, to wildlife management, to soils, to flying, to, and to put, to put your finger on one thing would be really difficult to do. Um, the, the flying is something that gives me, uh, it, it makes all of the, the sort of less attractive administrative side of it um, a little bit more bearable. So that, released for me and keeps me here it's really difficult to put your finger on one thing um so i think it's understanding the system it's understanding the governments or or the systems that you work with in um yeah and then it's just trying to get that practical knowledge out there yeah, Inter an interdisciplinary approach, an interdisciplinary thinking. Yeah, the re I think the reality on the ground is that it isn't one thing. It's, it's a matter of trying to bring all of those different skills, whether you've got them or someone else, all work, yeah. Yeah. Ian, thank you very much. Um, thanks for fielding our questions. I don't see any further questions in the chat at the moment, but um, I really appreciate your time and uh, the care that you took in preparing this presentation. It is vital that we transfer these, um, this expertise that you have um, gained to the next generation. Real pleasure, and I feel very honoured to be asked. And and um, yeah, and hopefully it does bring some benefit to to all the students and the protection of of Africa in the future. Thanks, Ian. thanks, Ian. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Um, thanks, Cheryl. We really appreciate it.